All right, so what I'm going to ask each of you to do is, um, you know, give a background on your farm and how, uh, particularly from the fresh the strawberry yeah. side of things, and then um, give us one bit of information that, you know, has helped, worked well for you, and then also, um, something that you've stumbled upon in the past and learned from uh, since, you know, really digging into the fresh market. So, who, who should we pick straws? Mike, do you want to start? Sure. Great. Uh, Mike Christensen. I'm located down by Albany, between Albany and Lebanon. We've been growing fresh market berries. There you go. For about 15 years now. We used to be a processor and Labor causes us to go into the fresh. Uh, we grow shuxin as our main variety. Um, I would say one of the things that is most important to us is establishing quality. If you don't have quality selling to the public, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Um, and then the problem that we've learned from is, actually we're still learning from, is trying to find a variety that will consistently yield high quality fruit for two years. Uh, one year, um, if you start pricing plants, you're going to find out that the plants are extremely expensive. We started off probably <coughs> three cents a plant, four cents a plant back in the early 80s, if not earlier, and we're now up to like nine cents a plant. So you're looking at nine thousand, or uh, just about a thousand dollars an acre to establish versus three to four hundred 15 years ago. And if you're only looking at one year, that's a pretty big hit. And so trying to find a variety that gives us the quality that we think the shucks can give us, and that's our main variety that we grow. Yeah, it's kind of our main thing right now we're trying to find. But um, as everybody else will say here, your customers, once you tune a customer in for the variety they like, it can be very hard to go to another variety and get them to like that berry or to try that berry. And what's your market at this point? We are strictly uh, out of our farm stand, and then we have a stand in another local town. And that's, we've done a little bit of Saturday market in Albany. Um, it's not a very high populous Saturday market, so to say, like Corvallis would be, or for the other Salem or Portland. So we maybe do that once every year during the season. Uh, we were, we've been a strawberry grower. My dad grew strawberries in the 40s. And uh, the early 80s, there was a farmer's market started in Hillsboro, and they invited us to come and sell strawberries. And uh, since then, we were doing up to 20 farmer's markets a week three or four years ago, and now we're down to 15 of the bigger ones. And uh, about 60% uh, of our sales on our farm is through farmer's markets, which has the other berries too. <clears throat> but we also do stores and stands, and we opened a farm stand three years ago, so we do some of it through that too. Uh, we raise hoods and albions, about 50%, I would say, go each way. And uh, the hoods we do sell through stores. It's delicate, but you, the customers really want it. So it's uh, worth the effort, and the Albions are good. And we actually even have people that pick the Albions over the hoods at the markets when you have them both there. So some people are used to that firmer berry. Um, I guess that's about it. <laughs> and your challenge versus your... Challenge is getting enough pickers like everybody else now. <laughs> Land and pickers is the biggest thing for us right now. There's more demand than we can fill as far as the stores go. And we actually, you know, we try to fill the retail end of it first because that's where we make our money. My name is Julie Shadeen, and my husband Tony and I have been growing uh, berries out near Sandy, Oregon for uh, I think it's 37 years now. 
and we're fairly new to strawberries. It's been eight years and we've only grown them for fresh and we started with day neutrals and so we sort of backed into hoods and then some totems. But uh, we grow Albion seascapes, Mar de Bois, and we tried a new one called Evie too. We, we buy some from Norse Farms. And um, I'm dis have to, I disagree with Chad on very little, but I must say I love Mara de Bois. <laughs> they are a complete pain to grow. My husband can't stand them. And, uh, but for, for what I do, which is sell directly to the public, we have two farm stands. All of our strawberries essentially go out through farm stands. We'll do a little overflow to the process market. And I will say for all of, very few of you, raise your hands for fresh. So I assume there are a lot of you that already are in the process market if you're here at a strawberry meeting, because that's going to be really important for anybody who's going to start up farming. You're going to need somewhere to go with your overflow, and you may be able to avoid third-party sanitation, uh, uh, you know, authentic you may be able to avoid a lot of things if you're going to sell direct to the public through either your own stands or farmers markets, but if you're going to need to go into Charlie's United Salad, any of those markets, or if you're going to need to go to a processor, you're going to have to um, uh, get involved with those kind of certifications. So just a little heads up, that's going to add to your uh, add to your burden. But for where we started, we uh, originally grew only machine picked four varieties of berries, big 40 acre blocks, and something happened, and, and our, our uh, processor wanted to send a hand-picking crew out, and we sent them out, and all the berries were off the bush in one day. And it was kind of a miracle to us when, with some threatening weather. And my husband and I are both uh, very, very interested in dealing with people. He does most of the farming, and I'm out with the public a lot. And we slowly started making the transition, and now we grow over 30 varieties of berries. But making the transition from cane berries to strawberries was dramatic. And then we started planting blueberries 10 years ago, as Chad said, it's, and, and going from a June bearing, and, we're, and for us it's backwards, um, into the day neutral is, it's, it's quite, a, quite a challenge. And I would agree, get involved with organizations like this, do your networking. I love that they brought buyers here today, because that's the other thing he stressed, don't grow anything, you don't know where you're going to sell it. Absolutely. We, when we started growing winter squash and pumpkins, that's the worst thing to grow without a market. Because <laughs> the rains come and you've got thousand acre bins all over your property. <laughs> so the Oregon Food Bank loved us for the first couple of years. <laughs> Little off topic, but that's to emphasize, know who you're gonna sell to. And the, the, the fellow that brought up the topic of differential in prices, those of us that grow fresh market and grow process know why there's a premium price. And we have a friend that uh, primarily in cane berries, and he did plant a few strawberries, was going to make the transition into fresh market, and after three years he quit. He could not stand the hassles of dealing with the public, uh, and he was trying not even on the wholesale, or even on the wholesale end. My, you know, my husband's always wanted to tell everybody, oh, go tell them to jump in a lake. I says, well, no, honey, you don't get to tell them to jump in a lake. Uh, he's great with, with, the, with the crew on that end. I know a lot of farmers, because as we say, we came from machine pick, process market. When we started making that transition, we had fellow farmers look at us, and they would never go back to hand picking. So they're not even wanting to deal with the people issue on the backside, let alone go out into the public. And so um, know who you are, know what you're capable of, and if if you really love doing that, if you really love sharing your passion for things, because man, I can sell Mara de Bois all day long. We never have enough. Mainly because they're so hard to grow. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, if you pick them right, and it's, 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 what, what's the worst we've learned? Hey, the squash story says it all. So. Right, okay, great, thank you, three. So I'm going to open it up for questions that you can ask, and I already see a hand up, so go ahead. I'm wondering how you do this picking. If you uh, are just picking right in the flats and you're going to sell fresh, and then you go back through and pick up stuff that's not fresh grade. And then also, I'm curious what kind of volume is it realistic to sell to farmers' markets? Okay, so I'll, I'll um, repeat the questions. The first question was um, how do you pick? Do you pick, you know, for strictly fresh market and then go back and pick? A process pick after 
and correct me if I'm not paraphrasing this correctly. And then the second question was what type of uh, volume do you need to have coming in to um, get into, is it more of like the... Well, really, my question is, I mean, is that something that you can do on a large scale, the farmer's markets? For farmer's markets, what, what's the volume that you need to get into farmer's markets or even something larger um, wholesale-wise? Farmer's markets, I would say, pretty well have their supply. I would say, I mean, there's probably some market there left but the biggest market available would be the stores, wholesale to the stores and stuff. Um, as far as picking, we pick directly into the fresh market. I mean, strawberries don't do good handling like blueberries. You can run them over a line and clean them up, but strawberries won't handle that. So we have our half flat that we sell in, or the clamshell. We pick directly into it. The picker's number is put on the flat, and we have a secondary flat that they show the overripe monkey face, all the extra stuff and someone was talking about the prices um, it was interesting I looked back at our records last night and last year 75 percent of what we picked went fresh and the process part was juice stock mostly and so 75 percent of the pounds went fresh and 25 percent went processed but if you go dollar wise 97 percent of the income was off the fresh and only three percent of the sales was dollar-wise was off the process, so it was a big difference. But last year was a poor price and juice stock too. Okay, we pick in the buckets, small bucket, and then um, we uh, bring them back to one person that sorts them and then goes through them as they go into the crate so that we keep our quality up. Uh, we don't sell anything into the processed. Uh, since we grow shucks in, most years, it's kind of a real, as they ripen, you can pretty much stay up with them as long as you don't overplant plants. Uh, we've left berries in the field. We've had a lot of the gleaners come out because we've gotten behind. Last year was a good example. They just all ripened at once. Um, that's kind of how, how we deal with it. Uh, but we're through the stands, our two stands, so we pretty much can only pick what our stands will sell for those two days. Uh, we don't like to hold our berries over for the next day, if we do get stuck with the crates that night, we'll normally put them in the cooler and then we'll discount them as a jam berry the next day. So hopefully we don't get stuck with a lot of crates overnight. We just, for us, we don't like to do that for our quality on our side with the shucks and berry. Um, we pick into one gallon buckets and they bring them to the edge of the field and, and as they're pouring them into their crate, then they sort out anything. We essentially for that small volume will likely then compost that. We don't compost on the farm with the problem with the Drosophila now. Um, we have a pig farmer that takes anything that is that is fruit material away from the farm. Any other questions? Okay, well we'll start at the front and head back. Go ahead. Uh, the first man, and I didn't catch your right. name, you mentioned that you were interested in maintaining better production in the second year. Is that a, and the other two people didn't mention it, is that an issue for most strawberry growers to try to maintain the plants a second year and keep up production? Um, with the variety that we grow, or our theory is when we sell to the public, they want big, beautiful berries. Yeah, a lot of times when you get into a second year field, no matter what it is, your size drops off sometimes quite dramatically. And if you put a crate of big berries out in front of somebody and a crate of small berries, which I'm going to needle Nat here, it's probably why his albions will sell better in hoods at times, they're going to take those big beautiful berries. So we always feel that we need to have that first year bigger, and that's what you normally get with your plants. Um, but we, we keep trying to maintain for those second years because you never know what kind of, uh, plants are expensive. It's just expensive to establish an acre of berries. You got a huge output that first year, you're getting nothing off them until that second year before you get into where you got production. So if you can get two years, production years out of them, it's a great thing. A lot of times we'll go through and skim our two-year-old fields uh, and then we'll let the gleaners in to finish them up unless the price or unless the size stays up. But if you get a whole bunch of little marbles, it's not worth it. You're just 
People don't want to buy them. The pickers don't like to pick them. Uh, we leave a lot of berries in the field just because we're after that big quality size. Uh, not, and, so, and we've tested some new experimental varieties. Um, problem is you can't get plants all the time. Some of them do well for us. Uh, we've seen some pretty good second year vigor in some of the new experimental varieties that Chad's come out with. But getting the nursery to replicate those plants when they don't know what kind of sales they're going to get is very hard. So, do, do you do anything, have you tried to do anything different in dormancy to maybe maintain more vigor the second year? Tried fertilizer, tried cutting down the crowns. Some years you can get a second year uh, plant that'll be beautiful. And some years, uh, if you get a really wet year, then you get the root rod in, and no matter how much phosphite you spray over the rows for the root rod, you just can never bring them back. Uh, some phylums, once you can, Sims love strawberry plants, you can control them that first year, but they come back the second and third year, second year in. Remember, it's two years before you're going to get production. By then, they've built back up, so then when you go into your third year as a plant in the field, those little buggers are just chewing the roots out, and there's nothing you can do about it. So, it's a lot of you know, playing with it and stuff on that for us. Uh, any other input from the rest of the panel? If not, Tim, you had a question. A uh, question, what, what changes have you made in the past few years uh, concerning food safety with Fresno coming into play uh, culturally as well as legally? What changes have you made? What are you planning to change? I'll just repeat that. Um, any changes uh, from your uh, company end of uh, food safety regulations in the past few years with um, FMSA and other regulations coming into play? Uh, we became GAP certified in the last couple of years. Um, one change is you don't reuse boxes that aren't in your control and uh, then all just the regular being more diligent on all the record keeping and keeping things clean. And we haven't GAP certified. Uh, we do a lot of U picks, and if you talk, I've talked to the GAP people that certify your field, and one of the big things is is you have to keep. You need to know who's in your field picking, and when you have U picks that are in those fields, also there's just no way you can do that. So even though we cordon off an area and try to maintain the U-pickers in one area, we just haven't went there. But we've increased what they're, I mean, I think all growers have to do the same thing. Uh, the public, I think, needs to realize, and this needs to go back to the people who are setting all these rules in place for us now, these, this stuff's growing out in a field where there's wildlife. And the public needs to know that you should wash your fruit. Uh, I'm more concerned about buying fruit out of a supermarket that some ladies picked up, or man's picked up, looked at with their fingers and thrown back in there. Where have those hands been? And yet that's not addressed at all. Um, so more like putting the word out that as the consumer, you should wash this fruit no matter what. It is growing outside where there's animals. Um, we're GAP certified and, and I think probably most of it is, is common sense. Um, what they're requiring of you, the the, um, the paperwork and certification can be a little bit onerous, but it's it's not something undoable. Uh, traceability, I think, is going to become a bigger and bigger issue. So you know that's that's a lot of the paperwork. What field did it come out of? You actually have to map your farm and and keep track of where every berry came from each day. And and if you're in the berry business, you get up and start over every day as if the day before it didn't happen. So. So that becomes a little bit of a paperwork issue. Go ahead. I have a question about, you each have your farm, your farm stand. Um, how important does refrigeration play in your daily, when you pick and shove it into a refrigeration thing as, the, as it sells, you pull it out? I mean, are we talking, is any anybody that's going to start this kind of a thing, are they going to have to invest in a refrigeration unit kind of thing? Last year. So give us a cost estimate. Last year was the first year that uh, we actually set a cooler up, and it wasn't for strawberries. 
it was for the other fruit and vegetables that we deal with. Uh, our strawberries, we pick that day, we sell that day. If we hold over, we either call the gleaners and they'll come out and get those crates if we think there's too many. If we just have a few, we'll put them in the cooler and sell them the next day as uh, jam berries. So for us... And by, and by a cooler, you mean what? We, we built a, a big cooler with a refrigeration, refrigeration unit. unit. Yeah, it'll keep us from 35 to 40 degrees. But that was not for strawberries. It was for apples, pears, okay. um, cane berries, blueberries, things like that. that. That's why we put that in. It wasn't for the strawberries. What I'm, was your cost? I think the refrigeration unit, it's a 20 by, no, it's 10 by 30, and I believe we dropped about 10,000 into it just for the refrigeration unit. And that's not in cloud, including, you know, the building itself. You can buy a big, you can buy a reefer trailer, probably easier than what we did, we found out after the fact, <laughs> and get the same thing for a lot less money. But that's us. Now, Matt, I'll tell you completely different. <laughs> everything we pick, well, pretty well, everything we pick is picked and put in the cooler and pre cooled, fan sucking the air through to extend the shelf life. A few markets that we do midday may go directly, but uh, a lot of the farmers' markets, even, are Saturday morning. We have to leave at 6 a.m., so they have to be picked the day before. And they're cooled and shipped. And the stores, we deliver, pick them, cool them, and deliver them early the next day. And I think the shelf life is probably longer doing that than if we delivered them directly warm and let them stay warm. Um, we have refrigeration walk-ins at both of our farm stands and a large one at the farm. But the first year we didn't. And I think our first cooler and our little fruit stand on first one in Boring was uh, two refrigerators back in the back closet, hold over. But we pick fresh every morning and sell at a deep discount Dale price the next morning every day. And so that really worked for us in the beginning, not dealing with the refrigeration. And strawberries are the one thing we don't pick the day before. If um, we only do a couple small farmers markets and if it gets so we're not daylight at 4.30, then we will, um, we will likely at least wait and pick our strawberries the morning of. They tend to uh, degrade faster than any other berry. We might put the raspberries or blue, definitely blueberries, but we might put raspberries or blackberries in the afternoon before, but not strawberries. I think this kind of segues into uh, just uh, the difference in equipment inputs needed for, or are there any differences in equipment uh, that's needed for fresh market production. I mean, I guess maybe let's go in tiers. Plasticulture production, so plastic with, you know, raised beds and planted in, whether it be with drip or not, um, versus just uh, matted row. So maybe we should talk about equipment uh, and supplies that are needed for, for that type of production. <laughs> start this end? Sure. That may be different than just yeah. in a regular process. Well, for, for day neutral, we do not use plastic. But they absolutely have to be on drip because you need a continual source of water and much the way old-fashioned June strawberry farmers always fight that early late spring rain and early June rain, which you think is never going to end. Imagine doing that on purpose every few days with overhead mm -hmm. irrigation to your berries. It's an absolute disaster. And so um, a lot, I think a lot of beginning farmers are, if you're looking to get into strawberries and do the June bearing, do some hoods for a roadside stand or fresh market, you're probably going to get away without um, irrigation. I bet there are a lot of still dryland uh, strawberry farmers out there. The vigor of your plants, it's going to be much more helpful if you can at least run some uh, hand line in there and, and uh, you know, as you're rejuvenating your field for the year. But you can likely keep your berry size up. You're going to deal with mud if you don't have plastic or if you don't get straw down, but you can, you can, get, you can pick a crop. But if you're going to do day neutral, you're going, you're going to have to get into uh, drip. We do uh, the plastic culture on the Albions, but the hoods, we actually do the old-fashioned 
matted, well, it's not really matted single hill, but on the ground without drip. Um, back in the late 80s, we did a few fields of selva, and we did the double row raised bed plastic drip and everything, and we were trying to sell them to the stores and trying to compete with California on the price, and it wasn't working, so we decided just to raise a few for the farmer's market we were doing then. So we went back to Selva, day neutral, with overhead sprinklers and matted row. And, uh, but once we watered, they got dirty and rotten. So, okay, we'll go back to drip. So we next field had drip in it and the berries laid in the dirt and got rot where they laid in the wet dirt. So we ended up going to plastic. And then once again, we went to the raised beds because of root rot and everything, so. Um, pretty much the same way on our June bears. We irrigate ours overhead when they need it, uh, not along, and we try to be, it's, um, if you go with low pressure on your irrigation hand lines, you're going to get a lot of mud. If you can get a real fine mist over the top, it helps us cut down on our mud or on the berries. Uh, the thunderstorms we get are a big problem for us. They will mud those berries up, and they are not nearly as pretty when the people want to buy them. But you're asking like for equipment, <laughs> yeah, aren't you? I mean. So um, you got to have a transplanter. Let's not go with the plastic at the moment. You're going to have to have some way of transplanting those berries into the rows after you've. And most and since the thing said that a lot of you were already um, processed growers, I'm going to assume that you're familiar with either a two-row or four-row planter, or you hire somebody to plan in need to be able to subsoil between those rows in the fall to break up the crust and the compaction from people walking. You're going to have to be able to somehow cut those, we do, cut the crowns down in the fall a little bit or in the summer after you renovate. Some people don't do that, some do. Uh, you got to spray for mold. It's um, people who do it organically, hats off to them, uh, but there's a lot of great fungicides out there with zero, de de zero degree, zero day pre-harvest, uh, really good fungicides. You're going to have to spray for rotten mold. Uh, you'll have the public ask you, did you spray these? You need to tell them yes. Um, you're going to have to be able to fertilize in the summer going into the fall because that's when strawberries pick up their biggest nutrient need for the next year. So you have to have some way of putting on your fertilizer either over the top of the plants or alongside them. And then you'll have to have some spraying done for your herbicides and weeds. So that kind of yeah. shotgun approach to that. Yeah. About the plastic. Well, I didn't go there. You can have it that <laughs> As far as the plastic culture, we've made all of our own equipment with help of my son, who will be talking later. <laughs> Um, we did a raise, formed the beds, and then we'd go by and put the drip in, and then mark the rows and plant, and then put the plastic over. And this last few years, we've made a machine to do it all at once, which really saved a lot of time and money, and I think it does a lot better quality, and you get the plants out earlier, quicker. Yeah. <laughs> that, that sum it up? Um, so I think, uh, well, Will, did you want to add something to gonna it? You're going to hassle your dad about something. That yeah. Exact thing, so. Okay. Go ahead, Laura. Yeah, so my question, it seems like, uh, from the sound of it, all of your farms are fairly diversified. And so I was wondering if you could speak to diversification as your farm as a whole, or what percentage of strawberries are your total input for your farm uh, profits, or what, just what percentage of that? sense. Ballpark it guys, come on. <laughs> um, we sell a lot to the public and if you're going to do this you got to have the mentality that you can deal with the public whether it's through the sales or whether you actually let them on your farm to pick the fruit. Um, so we grow a lot of stuff. I would put strawberries and I'm, when I make a lot of stuff is we got cane berries, blueberries, we have an orchard with apples, peaches, stuff like that. Um, and we do a lot of vegetables that we sell also, melons, things like that. So we're pretty diversified in that. 
Strawberries is one of our bigger money makers, uh, fruit as a general is. So I would probably put it like it's a tenth of what we do in the fresh market arena. Since the recession has kicked in, we've noticed for us um, a decrease in strawberry sales uh, in the last seven years, I think. And uh, we just think that strawberries are more of a luxury item and that people choose not to buy a crate at a time like they used to. They're now buying a one and a half quart or a half crate to eat, whereas you don't see as many jam buyers. And that may be part of what it is. We used to have a lot of people who canned and froze their berries, um, and that was usually an older generation, and we've lost them as the years go by. And so now the younger generation, I don't think, is as much into food processing. So. For us, it's kind of dropped off. Where it was maybe one of our bigger farm incomes, uh, now it's probably not as much. Actually, I was just looking at the data last night, so <laughs> we're about 47% of our sales are strawberries, and the rest is blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, and a few veggies and stuff. I think we're probably still less than 5% of strawberries, although we're looking to increase production and maybe the varieties because see it is one of those niches that isn't being filled out there in the local, uh, for, the, for the local consumer. I don't, uh, I see the California market and the ready availability of cheap strawberries at all times is more um, an erosive problem for um, our fresh industry. If you, if I go into a grocery, if I go into Safeway at the end of the day in the middle of June, I'm going to see all kinds of people with lost leader strawberries in, California strawberries in their grocery cart. And, um, and so I believe it's also, I agree, a tra uh, tradition and generational issue. We're just not seeing as many people putting up berries of any sort. But um, we, we've actually talked about, as we're <laughs> aging, <laughs> and don't have another generation coming behind. You know, we look at a 10-year plan with, or even longer with a, with a, a caneberry or a blueberry, and we're done planting. But we are looking at, uh, because of the, the life cycle of a strawberry, about how we might increase that. Because to be a full-line fruit stand, and I think, Mike, you were describing it pretty well, and um, you have to have a good strawberry you have to have a really good strawberry. And so um, it's much like we grow our own corn now. It's just so we don't lose more money on corn. You have to have really good corn and it's gotta be fresh. And so, um, you know, we ended up growing corn because of that, not because um, we wanted to be corn farmers. Although we finally felt like real farmers when we finally picked corn, I gotta say that. <laughs> I think one of the main question, like last questions or uh, it'll be a big discussion point or could be, is uh, labor. So how do you pay your pickers? Do you pay them hourly or do you pay them piece? Or, and um, is there a premium that they receive for uh, picking for the fresh market? We pay by the pound. So we base it off of what the minimum wage is and then um, go from there, but normally in good berries, the girls are making excellent money at it. Um, let's see, let's, we're about 25 cents a pound is what we're paying to have them picked at the moment. And um, it's a lot different than the processed pick, where the processed pick, they're bringing everything in, and in this you can't afford to have them bring anything in, so you're basically letting them have, for us, kind of a, like a glorified cream. So we really don't necessarily want the little marble berries, yet the little marble berries will cause you rot and problems down the road, so we try to get those picked off. But getting people that can pick quick and a very good berry, um, it's probably nine-tenths the battle on that one. You gotta have a premium coming in. You just can't have them bringing in everything and expect it. I mean, they can sit there and pick orange, green, red, and stuff, and you're not making any money, and it's all going out into the bucket to be thrown away out of the field uh, by the pound. So you, you've got to have good pickers, and at times you've got to pay them a lot more. We pay by the half flat or the flat for a 
and I was about 40 cents a pound we paid to the picker, but that flat's got to be perfect berries, and we're very picky on it, and their number goes on it, so if we find problems later, we know which picker it is. And then at the same time, they have a flat, a cannery flat underneath that the juice stock goes in, and we're, I think, 14, 15 cents a pound for that. And this last year, we were getting, we were losing money picking that, but we still pick it to clean up the field and keep the field, especially with the Albions. The June crop, you know, if you miss a berry two the first time and a couple of second time, you might make it through the three picks or whatever. But Albions can't do that with picking for four or five months. Oh, for you, let's put that on. So even though he's saying 40 cents a pound, I'm saying a quarter. Our buckets, he's paying by the flat. Our bucket fills up a full crate where he's doing a half crate. So we're pretty much in the same ballpark if you want to look at it. I'm just like, I can see eyes out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, pickers come to us. <laughs> yeah, so. You've got, yeah, you've got a couple bucks. Tell them that we have bucket people out there yeah. and that there are, we've got kids out there rotating, picking up the cruise bucket, so they don't have to move. They're just picking and going. And uh, I think our top picker can pick a 10 pound bucket in when the berries are really good, four minutes. So she's getting two dollars every four minutes. So we have little primo times where they're making over twenty dollars an hour picking. And, yeah, yeah it's not so good at times. And then ours have to look nice on top. It's not just dumped in. Okay, no fighting. No, no fighting. I, I mean, you have someone else. You're paying someone else to face the flat or to yeah. make the flat look good. So pickers have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> We understand what you meant. Um, we pay by the crate as well on all the berries and by the pound for cannery pick, and there is quite a spread, once again, answering the question of the fellow that was uh, remarking about the, the difference in price between the processed and the... We actually think probably on some of our blackberries and even the raspberries recently, we may uh, have been making more in the processed market than our fresh once you add the price of the crate, once you add the extra labor. The price has been pretty uh, pretty strong at the process <coughs> end for those, but we like to keep our keep our price at. We pay five dollars a crate to have them pick a crate of strawberries, and um, we we do put some of the nicer people on that. And we just leave them be. We just we just trust that every every berry in there is is good, and uh, uh, and they they take care of us. So how big is a crate? They generally about ten pounds. So with all you guys, you have pretty diversified farms and pretty heavy labor needs. Do you see it as an advantage having strawberries that you can have pickers there earlier in the season that can then lead into your other crops and vice versa, I guess, is that an advantage for strawberries having a diversified crop, which then you need labor for later on after strawberries are finished? Yes. <laughs> is, I'm going to repeat the question Jason asked if... Um, there's an advantage to having a diversified farm where the uh, pickers are able to, you know, uh, be there early in the season and throughout the season. Uh, so a consistency from that stand and, um, sorry, basically pregnancy it. brain here. Is that it? <laughs> yeah, that's basically it. Okay, so let's roll with that. Short answer is yes. I mean, I guess the, the better a season, yeah, you, the the better a season you can provide, obviously, and if you can get them started in there early. And do you think you could have the labor requirements you have for your other crops if you didn't have strawberries, and vice versa? If you have only you had strawberries, do you think you could meet your labor needs? Oh, that's a more that's a more complicated question. <laughs> well, possibly because there isn't a lot of other hand harvesting that has started. You haven't really even gotten into cherries by then. The cherries might start to overlap cherries and apricots, which, of course, are up the gorge over on the east side a little bit more. And raspberries don't start up till later in June. So it could be that you've actually got a little advantage for the labor market before all the other hand harvested crops kick in. I think it helps us to uh, have the early crop and then... We always lose some after strawberries go into the other blueberries and stuff, but we maintain a lot of them that want to be able to pick the strawberries all summer too. When you get into the Albion's pick a lot quicker than the hoods. I mean, they can pick 20 half lots an hour sometimes, but you got good Albion's picking. Well, the hoods are smaller, big bush, and it takes longer to pick them, so. Yeah, 
I would, I would tend to agree with that. But in the same aspect, though, that we go from whenever strawberries start all the way through into November. So once we get a crew on, they know that they pretty much got a job into November. And then we have actually kept some of the people on when they want to work uh, pruning throughout the winter and stuff. So that has helped us there in that aspect, too. Whereas before, once school started, everybody took off. It would be great to be able to get kids out there picking again. Are you crazy? No. <laughs> you can get good kids at times. Transfer, you gotta weed through them, but with proper documentation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, so there is a premium, or there is a, a benefit then to a day neutral production setting with regards to labor. It sounds like they can pick more at a time, as well as stretch out their picking. Same in number of pickers, you can pick more with a day neutral because you can stretch it out. And they do make good money in July and August on strawberries, so it helps keep them there for the other crops too. All right, last uh, last question in the back there. Have any of you tried digging up runners to plant? Have any of you tried to dig up runners and plant for no. the next crop? Uh, especially with hoods, virus is the, one of the main problems. And just when you, especially, and the other ones, uh, Albion's with the uh, plastic culture, you're playing for drip, plastic, and everything. You want to start with a good plan. So. All right. Um, I think that that's great. Good discussion. So we'll have a break now. We can give the panel a uh, hand.